I don't know how to work that. <laughs> how could this happen? Look at this. That one's really wobbly, actually. It's crazy. in the transmittance through the canopy, depending on what angle you're looking at the canopy. So if you're looking straight down on it, you see a lot of the ground compared to how much green is there. So the transmittance is high at this angle. But at this angle, where you're looking you know, like that at the canopy, you don't see any ground. It's all green. So the transmittance through the canopy really depends on the angle that you're looking. And then, this, this uh, brought up this concept of leaf angle distribution. So to, to deal with that, uh, that um, property of plant canopies, we've got to come up with a, a representation, a mathematical function that, that, uh, that captures that dependence of transmittance as a function of the view zenith angle, let's say. So the, the the angle between which the way your eye is looking through the canopy and a point straight up above you. That's the view zenith angle. And I'll, I'll, I'll apply this then to the sun, the direct beam of the sun and the solar zenith angle and, and the transmittance of that direct beam of the sun also depends on the angle uh, that, that the sun is looking through the canopy. So to do that, we have to come up with this idea of leaf angle distribution. So two things that affect the transmittance through the canopy. Number one, how much leaf area is, is in the canopy. Or, you know, in more complex canopies, leaves, stems, uh, reproductive organs, flowers, everything in the canopy. So the amount of that is one thing. The other thing is the distribution of that in space, the angles that those leaves have both re with respect to the vertical and with respect to the azimuth, to the points in the compass. And through all this, uh, we're, we're, the, the assumption is that the azimuthal distribution doesn't affect the transmittance, right? It's random. And so we, we're not going to consider in explicitly the azimuthal dis distribution of leaf area, just the vertical distribution. And that's not a bad assumption for uh, canopies that are relatively homogeneous, that cover the ground. Um, you know, like, like once you get to the leaf area index, I don't know, somewhat above one. You know, and you don't have distinct row structure in your canopy. When you, when you have distinct rows like that corn canopy, it just looks like this is a lot harder to, to, to actually, it's a lot harder to uh, estimate transmittance through a canopy like this than if, uh, well, let's see, then in a canopy like this, right, with, with leaves all over the place. If you have row structure, just that's complication, so we won't do that. All right, so, so, but, but, Okay, so two things. The amount of leaves, the leaf area index, and the distribution of those leaves in space, the leaf angle distribution are important. And here are some examples of a near vertical leaf angle distribution. Here's a spherical leaf angle distribution. Here's a horiz near horizontal leaf angle distribution. And you can see how these, how these uh, uh, extinction coefficients vary for these different canopies as a function 
of the zenith angle that you're viewing the canopy or that the sun is moving through the canopy. A lot of this started, actually, this, 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 um, this way of dealing with, oh yeah, but then Galen Campbell has his, has his uh, ellipsoidal leaf angle distribution given by this equation. And Lorraine Doyle has another formulation for leaf angle distribution. But a lot of this, this, uh, area started uh, or was developed in the late 1950s, early 1960s in England by a group of people that were interested in how much leaf area is in a pasture. You know, and so one way you can do it is clip off the leaves and measure them, you know, add them all up. But that's kind of tedious and it destroys your pasture. So they, they, they used a technique called inclined point quadrants, believe it or not. And a fellow named, with the last name Warren Wilson, was instrumental in some of this work. So if you look, if, if you search for his name, you'll find papers in the late 60s, I mean late 50s, early 60s. And what they did was they had long needles and they pushed them through the canopy, their pasture canopy and counted how many times the needle hit a leaf on its way through the canopy. And what they found was the number of times you hit a leaf depended on which way you were pushing the needle. If you did it this way, you get one answer. If you do it this way, you get a different answer. It makes sense. I mean, the path is longer when you're, when, if you're not looking straight down. Anyway, they, they developed this technique of estimating leaf area index from there, how many times they hit the leaf and the angle that they pushed through the canopy. That's a weird thing. But you don't, now we don't use a, a needle, we use light. And we can do the same thing. So here's a canopy, looking sort of from the bottom of it. And notice in this picture, there are some parts of the total leaf area in this canopy that are lit up by the sun directly. These bright parts here. So, so the direct, what I call the direct beam of the sun, you know, that disk in the sky shining right on that part of the leaf. That illuminates some of the canopy. And then there are other parts of the canopy, the, the leaf area in the canopy, that are not illuminated directly by the sun, but they get diffuse light from the sky and from scattering of this sunlight in the canopy. So the, 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 there's a, a portion of the canopy that's only lit by diffuse light, and then a portion of the canopy that's lit by direct, the direct beam of the sun, plus the diffuse light coming from the sky and scattering. So in order to deal with, because, because the, the uh, light response curve of small conductance is nonlinear, we have to, the simplest approach we could take is to divide the canopy into two classes, sunlit leaves, these bright parts here, and shaded leaves, darker portions. And what we'll do then is divide the canopy this way, and then estimate an average illumination of the sunlit leaves, calculate as to model conductance for those leaves, estimate an average illumination of the shaded leaves, get a to model conductance for those, and add them up, weighted by their appropriate leaf area. And that, in that way, we can come up with this to model conductance that's representative of the whole canopy. So here's how to do it. Uh, the transmittance of sunlight through the canopy, or Warren Wilson's needle, or his inclined point quadrat, or whatever else you want to use, the transmittance through the canopy is given by e to the minus k of theta times the period. Right. So this clearly shows the important features of the canopy that we have to consider, namely how much leaf area is in the canopy and the distribution, the angular distribution of that leaf area in the canopy. All right. Once we have this equation, and this is based on, on geometrical consideration, we could calculate the leaf area index that's in the sun, 1 minus T beam over K theta. 
and the leaf area index that's in the shade, which is simply the total leaf area minus the sum length. So here's a way to separate the, this leaf area into two classes, sum length shaded. Note that the extinction coefficient, a function of the, the view zenith angle or the solar zenith angle, in case of the direct angle of the sun, it, it, it depends on that. And this T beam, also implicit in there, is this dependence on the zenith angle of the sun. So as the sun moves through the sky over the course of a day, this canopy will have different fractions of, of leaf area that's either lit up or not lit up, depending on where the sun is in the sky. Even if it doesn't change its leaf angle distribution like soybeans do during the day. This, this is a, a, a maze, this, this spherical leaf angle distribution maze is relatively constant over, over the day. Now, once we have our leaf area divided, we can estimate the average illumination on the sunlit leaves and the average illumination on the shaded leaves. And that's what these two equations are. T sun, the, the, the average sunlit illumination is this thing, r sub dv times g of theta over cosine theta plus what's in the shade what's coming from the shape. G of theta is just another extinction coefficient for the canopy that I already explained. Cosine theta, that's what it is. R sub dv is the direct beam radiation that's incident at the top of the canopy. So how much radiation is coming into the top of the canopy from the sun, from the disk of the sun itself? Not from the sky, but just from the sun. And that's something that's typically uh, typically. Okay, so if you're familiar with the, uh, uh, um, what do they call it, the high planes? That's a good one. High planes Aglab in Sydney, near Sydney. I've been there. Everyone should go there. It's a very good place to visit. And they have a weather station on it that's part of the high planes. Uh, uh, climate data network, whatever they call it. Uh, the other, the other, I, I get confused because now it used to be one thing and now it's split into two. It's the High Plains Regional Climate Center is one, and Nebraska Mesonet is the other one. And I never know which one to get, but they have all these uh, little weather stations across the state, you know, hundred of them probably at least, probably more than that, over the state. And you can get hourly weather information from you can download it, you can get uh, the, uh, the daily stuff's one thing, and then you can request the hourly stuff, and they'll gladly give it to you for any of these stations all over the state. Um, <coughs> however, long winded way, they don't split the incoming radiation into direct beam and diffuse fractions. That's like uh, a little bit more than what typically is done with weather stations, with weather <coughs> monitoring. But you can do it. You can buy an instrument that does it, or you can use some equations. Al Weiss has a, a publication on if you have the total and you know where you are on the surface of the Earth and what day of the year and what time of day it is, you can calculate the direct beam and diffuse fractions or estimate it based on how much light you, you're, you're getting. So, so there are ways to get at this. The direct beam, separating the, the light coming into the top of the canopy into direct beam fraction and diffuse fraction. Diffuse coming from the sky. Okay, anyway, this is the direct beam fraction. So that's that equation. And then the, the uh, equation for the average illumination of the shaded parts of the canopy is R sub little d which is the diffuse PAR incident at the top of the canopy, times this thing, which is based on the leaf area index, and this, uh, this letter C, which is a correction that you can see here that's due to scattering of, direct, of, of the direct beam radiation by everything in the canopy. So this equation is based on uh, geometrical considerations and trigonometry and uh, if you're interested in that, I, I point you to Juhan Ross' uh, 
chapter, Radiative Transfer in Plant Communities, in John Monteith's book, published many years ago, but still a classic, called Vegetation in the Atmosphere, Volume 1. And he's got a nice chapter in here called just that, Radiative Transfer in Plant Communities. Um, really interesting stuff, and stuff that you don't, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been hard, or it was hard to find um, this type of information, such as the vertical distribution of leaf area within a plant canopy for different species. You know, that, that's useful information, but try to find it. Anyway. See, I get excited when I talk. <laughs> anyway, this is a, a nice set of books. Uh, volume one is called, uh, it's an edited volume, right? So each chapter written by a different person. Volume one is called Principles, and volume two is called Case Studies. So in this volume, it's, it's, uh, each chapter is a different type of plant, a different type of plant canopy. So we have sunflower, cotton, a coniferous forest, citrus orchard, grassland, you know, tundra. You know. Anyway, nice set of books. But this guy, Johan Ross from Estonia, um, was one of the pioneers of uh, radiative transfer in plant communities and came up with a way to estimate the direct the illumination in a plant canopy based on, you know, geometry, trigonometry. This shaded fraction and this correction term come from John Norman's work with his uh, canopy model called Cupid. And I asked him one time where this, this, where this equation came from because it looks kind of like, you know, how'd you come up with that? And he said, oh, I don't know, it just seemed like it fit the data. You know? <laughs> that was his response. So there you go. You know. Anyway, we have two equations now to estimate the illumination shift. Um, what would it, would it change in uh, like a cloudy day? Ah, so a cloudy day, a cloudy day, this term is zero. ZRDB? R with the big D, big D. Okay. So the direct, on a cloudy day, that's nothing. And so, the sun, the sunlit leaves just become what 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 all the leaves in the ship and the canopy are least shaded. Yeah, on a cloudy day, yeah, this 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 ratio of uh, R D B to R D B plus R little d. This ratio is called the sometimes called the direct beam fraction. So, so this is a number that ranges from zero to one. Well, it's never one. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's never one because this is never zero. Um, so it ranges from zero on a perfectly cloudy day to maybe, I don't know, 0 0.9 or point, on a perfectly sunny day maybe 90% of the radiation is from the direct beam of the sun, and the rest is from the sky. So, that, that yeah, cloud, that's a good point, cloudy day. Of course, cloudy day, this term goes away too. And so on a cloudy day, all the leaves are just given this illumination. Average. Both these books are in the see why it's not so Okay, now we're, we're essentially finished, right? Because now, if we have a light response curve for stomatal conductance, so here's stomatal conductance on Y, and light, incident light on X, from darkness to full sunlight, and these are our actual values, each, each symbol is a is a separate measurement. Um, once we have such a light response curve for stomatal conductance, 
we use the previous equation to estimate the average illumination on the sunlit leaves, we could come up to this curve and read off what the average stomatal conductance is for that class of leaves. And then we can calculate the shaded leaves the same way. Read off an average lumen, uh, an average stomatal conductance for those shaded leaves. And the canopy conductance then is that sunlit stomatal conductance times the leaf area index in the sun plus the shaded stomatal conductance times the leaf area index in the shade. So just those two conductances weighted by the proportion of leaves in both classes. And that gives us a canopy stomatal conductance term that's appropriate for use in, say, pentamonti. So we can stick that term here and measure all the rest of these things and estimate transpiration from plant canopy based on what we know about stomatal conductance and the effect of light on stomatal conductance. Analogously, we can use not a, a, a light response curve for stomatal conductance, but let's use a light response curve for photosynthesis. That's what this is. These are two grass species. So here's light intensity, here's photosynthesis, net CO2 assimilation rate, let's call it. And you can see the two curves here. We can use the same procedure to estimate the illumination on the sunlit portion of the canopy, the shaded portion of the canopy, come up with an average sunlit leaf photosynthetic rate, an average shaded leaf photosynthetic rate, and cal calculate canopy photosynthesis based on those two classes of leaves, as if light was the only thing affecting canopy photosynthesis. What you know is not true, but goes a long way. So here's, okay. Um, Lycor had this application note um, a few years ago. I don't know that, that you can get it from Lycor anymore, but you can find it at this website. I checked this this morning. You can find it at this website too. But they have a, a application, what they call application notes, like a 10, 15 page thing that describes this method of estimating canopy transpiration and, and uh, canopy photosynthesis based just on exactly what we've been talking about last two days. So it's a nice it's a nice application of still I wish they still published it, but I don't think they do anymore. And you can find it on that website. It goes into some more detail, obviously than what we've done here, but the gist of it is and light is the only thing that's affected. So, uh, John Norman had a retirement. He's retired now, right? Right when he retired, the American Meteorological, American Meteorological Society uh, at their annual meeting in the group that deals with micrometeorology, so the, the meteorology of things close to the surface like plant canopy. They had a symposium dedicated to him and his work. And so Betty, Walter Shea, and I, and other, Mark Mesarch and others, um, prepared a, a talk <coughs> for that symposium. And it was based on this scaling up stuff. We wanted to see how well this idea worked. I mean, John was one of these people that was always knew the answer, right, and would tell you what the answer was. And next week, you know, he might be just as adamant about an answer that was a little bit different than he had told you the week before, but, you know, one of these forceful people. So, so uh, you know, we decided, well, let's see how well this scheme works. So what we did was uh, enlisted Andy Sucre's help, and he had any covariance measurements of CO2 fluxes from our, our fields up at me. We had all the information that we needed to look at in this case, not stomatal conductance, but 
but photosynthesis. And we scaled up just using light to estimate canopy photosynthesis. Combine that with soil surface CO2 flux to estimate NEE, the exchange of CO2 with the atmosphere. And these are the comparisons with the measured data from eddy covariance in the open samples, the simulated data in the closed samples. You can see for three sites of, oh, this is one site, uh, for maize, two, and soybeans, it doesn't do too bad of a job. This scheme is scaling up. And this is just based on light, nothing else. So, as a first approximation, I argue that's not a bad approach. Okay. Um, for more details, here's the paper that we published based on that work. Uh, this is a nice overview of leaf to canopy scaling techniques. And Suat had students that were interested in this idea too, and used it to scale up leaf to model resistance to canopy resistance. Here's a publication here. So, I say, next time you see a plant canopy, think of its leaf angle distribution. I told you this last time, right? Yeah, you know. Over Thanksgiving, maybe you'll see something. And see, and then think about how that transmittance depends on the angle that you're looking. Because that transmittance affects how sunlight is, is utilized by plants, both in terms of fixing carbon and in losing. So, uh, a week from today, I'll probably finish up the one I'm going to start next. I'm not sure I'll get through it all in 45 minutes, maybe. Um, after that is review, because a week from Thursday, a week from Thanksgiving, will be the third quiz for the course. That's where we're at. So we're all on the same. Well, I just showed uh, how well that particular scaling up scheme works just based on light. But we know light isn't the only factor affecting light. And, uh, you know, let's say, okay, it works pretty well, but what about uh, vapor pressure deficit? What about the effect of VPD on stomatal conductance and how that affects uh, canopy behavior? How can we scale that? In order to deal with that, with VPD, typically uh, what's used is this, uh, you know, this transpiration rate is total leaf conductance to the water vapor times delta W for uh, this G term times saturation vapor pressure at the lead temperature minus the vapor pressure in the air divided by the total pressure, right? Ah. In order to incorporate something that uh, about this that we know is, is a real thing, we have to know something about the leaf temperature. Moreover, temperature in, in CO2 fluxes all night long the plants are losing carbon, and you're, you know that, that the respiration rate is a strong function of temperature. And so the leaf temperature then at night is an important thing too. You can approximate it with the air temperature, and that may not be too bad at night. But during the day, leaves typically are not at the same temperature as the air. In fact, with the stomata open, the canopy temperature will be below the air temperature. Whereas if things get stressful and the stomata close, the canopy temperature will be above the air temperature. <coughs> so to deal with, with, with these types of issues, we need to be able to say something about what's the distribution of temperatures, of leaf temperatures in a plant canopy, and what factors affect leaf temperature. 
you know, I'm taking a real quantitative, of, no, not real, but a semi-quantitative approach right, to this whole subject. You know, when I, I look at the plant canopy, I think, how much carbon is being fixed? How much water is being lost? And that kind of thing. You know, there are other ways to look at plant canopies, too. Not in terms of that, but just in terms of, I don't know, the color or uh, their, it brings up, or their beauty, right? It brings up a quote of Victor Hugo, right? Yeah, but here, here, this quote. The beautiful is as useful as the useful, perhaps more so. I like that. But right now, I'm not thinking of the beautiful. I'm thinking of like the useful, the practical. <laughs> but you know, there's some inherent beauty in these things, too, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. There is. <laughs> Well, infrared thermometry. We can we can we can estimate. I didn't bring one in, but I have a ray gun uh, looking thing that you point at something and pull the trigger, and it tells you the temperature of that thing that you're pointing at. Like this, like what this guy's doing with the plant canopy. We can point this at the plant canopy, and it'll give us an average temperature of the stuff that we're looking at. If we know the emissivity of the target. There's the trick, right? And it's based on Stefan Boltzmann law. Here's for a black body. The energy that's radiated by, by a black body is proportional to the fourth power of its temperature times this Stefan Boltzmann constant. But you know, black body, it's like the physics problem where you ignore friction. It, nothing's a black body, right? Most things are gray bodies. And so you have to stick another term in here, which is the emissivity. I'll, I'll show you that. But anyway, if we can, if we use an infrared, infrared thermometer, we can get some idea of what the average temperature of the plant canopy is. And here's a study where they did this stuff, uh, looking at buffalo grass and Kentucky bluegrass, and uh, leaf canopy temperature minus air temperature. Here's zero. Here's zero. And in this case, anyway, uh, it's hard for me to read this. But over time, that, that increases as the canopy gets more and more stressed. Okay. But anyway, that's just to go to, to, to deal with uh, leaf temperature, we have to struggle with the leaf energy balance. So. The amount of energy that's absorbed by this leaf has to go somewhere, has to be used for something. We have conservation of energy. We're not converting that energy to matter inside this leaf or something crazy like that. That energy has to balance. The energy that's coming into this leaf 